So this week, you know, we're um, looking back on uh, the sufferings of Christ, the agony of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, and I've been um, just meditating, looking, uh, wanting God to give me divine downloads of, uh, of, of what Christ went through for us. Um, for us as believers, we have a understanding of who he was. I mean, a lot of people have suffered through the years and uh, experienced terrible uh, situations, but he, uh, he was not just a man. And without controversy, Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness for God was manifested. God was manifested. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. It's, um, it's impossible for the human mind to comprehend that the author, the creator, the maker, the former, the fashioner of all existing things would uh, take on human flesh and walk among us and reveal the will of the Father to us. And it's not just the fact that God would become a man, but the fact that God himself then chose to take the punishment, the wrath, uh, the anger, of, of a holy God upon himself. He was made sin, the Bible says, that we might be made righteous. He was made poor that we might be made rich. That wealth is not talking about natural wealth, it's talking about spiritual wealth because we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So throughout the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, when you get to the end of every one of those gospels, it begins to give us uh, a detailed description of what Christ went through. And yet in the old covenant, there is revealed to us in scriptures, I think a, a, a much greater detail of exactly what was going on in Isaiah 53 and also in Psalms chapter 22. And we'll look at that before we close tonight. But I wanna begin here that after Jesus had uh, partaken of the Last Supper with his disciples, and Judas had gone to sell him for 30 pieces of silver. They went into the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus began to speak to his disciples in Matthew chapter 26. In verse 36, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be, listen, sorrowful and very heavy. So that's the very first time that in the life of Christ in his 33 and a half years did he ever begin to speak like this. And he begins to reveal to us what he was going through. Um, Jesus began to have the sins of the world deposited upon him the uh right after he had uh, uh offered up the bread and the grape juice as his as symbolic of his bread and of his flesh and his and his blood then said jesus unto his disciples verse 38 my soul my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death jesus Never, ever did he, will he, or ever will he exaggerate. Everything that God has ever spoken was the exact, precise truth. Uh, he, the Father is called the Father of lights, in whom there is no verminous, neither shadow of turning. There is no exaggeration. And he said, my soul is nigh unto death. He, he would have died in the natural, any man would have died before they even were arrested with all the sins of the world that were placed upon him. I mean, we, we, our own sins are a heavy burden, aren't they? In the light of a holy God. I mean, our sins weigh us down. And the Bible says that, that uh, the very heavens are filthy before God, how much more man who drinketh iniquity like it's water, that means Anything that is not of faith is sin. So Jesus never sinned. He never will sin. 
But Jesus never sinned, but what came upon him was the sins of the world. Um, we're not talking about a, a thousand or a million or a billion, who knows? The sins of the world. What Christ did on Calvary was enough to cover for every sin. If every human being would have chosen to believe and to follow, to love, to obey, Every human being, the blood was there and sufficient to get every human in heaven. I saw back in 2012, I saw the lamb slain, laying on his side. The third rib pierced. I saw glistening, bright blood pouring from his side into a pool. And I, I heard the Lord say that the blood that was in the pool was enough to cover for every sin ever committed. And of course, the only way that blood is applied is by faith. Jesus never got out of the realm of faith, so the sin that was placed upon him was not his, it was ours, your sin, my sin. And like I said, if God had not strengthened him, he would have died before he ever went to the cross. We'll see that. And he says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death till you hear and watch with me. And he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it be possible, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So that in itself is a very deep, deep revelation to think that Jesus, throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he asked the Father, Lord, if there is any other way. And the only reason, and you never see him pray that before or pray it again. Uh, if there would have been another way, the Father would have provided it. There was no other way. Uh, he said, Father, not my will, but let thy will be done. Three times he cried out, uh, Father, if there is another way. And surely the Father would have answered him, but there was no other way. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's why the Bible says he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In order to bring to pass the ultimate purpose and plan of the triunity of God, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. The Lamb had to be slain. Jesus is that Lamb, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In Mark 14, 32, it says, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he saith to the disciples, Sit here, here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. So here's a first, he's amazed and extremely heavy. Something is happening, something mysterious. Uh, I'm gonna say something amazing and wonderful and yet extremely evil, it, it, wicked. Not, not, not God ain't wicked, I'm saying that the sins are being poured into Jesus like a chalice. Uh, remember, he. He told us that we can drink from his cup, but that meant he took our cup. He took the cup of the Father's wrath. Somebody had to pay the price uh, for a sin, and Jesus chose to pay that price for us. And he began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy, and saith unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death, Terry here, watch. Uh, I'm going to read Luke 22, 43. And there appeared an angel unto Jesus from heaven, strengthening him, strengthening him. So whatever was happening in that garden, I was in that garden. I had the privilege of being in that garden in December of 2014. Uh, don't know how far I was from where Jesus himself this experienced, but I was... I was in a garden in Gethsemane with other believers and we, we all separated from one another and we all went and we just laid on our faces before God, wanting to be in that physical place where Christ himself was, but not really being able to totally ever comprehend what Jesus did for us. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven and strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. If you go online, you can look up and you can discover there has been times when people were under so much pressure that literally the pressure was so great 
that it caused the blood vessels uh, in the brain to begin to rupture and they would literally, as it were, begin to sweat blood and drops of blood would begin to fall. The pressure, and, and, and I do not at all believe that Christ himself was afraid of the physical abuse he was about to endure, um, the verbal abuse, uh, the fact that the people were going to deny him, that Peter was going to deny him thrice, that people were going to deny him as the king and declare that we have no king but Caesar, that they were going to lie about him, that he was going to have to drag that cross up Golgotha's hill, that he was going to be nailed to it, slammed uh, into the ground as he was on the cross and hung and to be mocked. Um, and to be ridiculed. I, I don't believe at all. I mean, no, nobody, nobody in their right mind would look forward to something like that. And it's beyond, you know, have you ever just slammed your thumb with a hammer? <laughs> I know Stephen tonight, he accidentally almost burned his hand. And I mean, he loud out a scream like it was the end of the world, you know. <laughs> but, and I told him, I don't blame you. I mean, that heat, that extreme heat hit his hand. But uh, so who wouldn't, who wouldn't be full of of, of, of fear but here's the thing Jesus had no fear this is what's unbelievable and, and but it is believable for us that Jesus had no fear of what he was going to go through he didn't have a fear but he understood the the results of it now this goes even beyond now if we go beyond that that to the point where he, where he finally said uh, into thy hands come in on my spirit and he gave up the ghost the Bible says, I'm going to say this again, the Bible says, his spirit went to heaven, but his soul went to hell. He says, thou did not uh, leave my soul in hell. And Peter talked about it in the book of Acts, and it's, uh, it talks about it in the Old Covenant. And, and so I, I had an experience where uh, I, I literally uh, uh, cried out to God and let, let God, asked God to let me go to hell back in 1975. February, March, probably April in April. And uh, the floor of my room opened up and I, I fell into hell. And I was only there for two and a half hours. Let me tell you something. It, I did not, I, I didn't even write a book about that until 20 and 10. And, um, and, and, and that happened in 1975. So we're talking 35 years later. I, I don't, I wouldn't even want to talk about it. It was ter so terrible. You know, these people supposedly that went to hell and then right away they begin to tell everybody about it and what happened. I just, I don't believe most of it. Uh, I couldn't talk about it. I, I couldn't, I didn't even want to think about it. And yet God gave me that experience where I could have compassion on people who, who are going there and, and, and to try to encourage them not to go there. But Jesus, his soul, his righteous soul was in hell for three days. I was there for two and a half hours. It was, it was like a minute stretched into a lifetime. I mean, when I was there, a minute, it felt like I was there forever, and I was there just for two and a half hours. Jesus, his soul was there for three, and a, three, 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 three days, wasn't it? Approximately three days he was there. And, and why did he do it? Now, we're not just talking about a man. We're talking about God himself. The soul of Jesus Christ was in hell for three days. Now, if you have a problem with that, that's not my problem. It's yours because it's in the Bible. And um, let, let, me, uh, let me read what it says in Hebrews because the Bible says that there's a crowd of witnesses that has gone before us that we are to consider Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our, our, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus endured the cross. Listen, despising the shame. Uh, Jesus did not want to go, but he went. Love drove him there. The love for the Father and the love for humanity. The love for those who would follow him, love him, serve him, and obey him. And the Bible in the book of Hebrews talks about woe to those who tread afresh upon the blood of Christ. But it says he was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now listen, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you become wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So it's an encouragement what Christ went through 
uh, starting in Gethsemane all the way to his resurrection, is an encouragement for us not to get discouraged, not to become faint-hearted, not to surrender or yield to our enemy, the devil. Look at Jesus. Consider what Jesus went through. I mean, the sins of the world are not on us. As a matter of fact, Christ took our sins. <laughs> and that's why you can have joy and peace, because he took our sins, and he took them all. So consider Jesus. Don't let the devil sell you a bill of goods that says you can't overcome. It's not worth resisting. It's not, it's not worth the pain. Matter of fact, what did Paul say? He said, I, I reckon that the suffering of this present evil time is not worthy to be compared uh, to the glory that shall be revealed in us. The glory that shall be revealed in us. What a day that will be when my Jesus I'll see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. Um, Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 gives us another perspective. It says, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. For in other words, for three hours, there was utter darkness as he was upon the cross. Actually, Luke goes into a much greater detail. Luke 23, 44, and it was about the sixth hour, listen, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Shoo. A darkness upon the whole earth. That was no eclipse. That was the Son of God hanging upon the cross, the Creator who spoke all things into existence, for without him was not the made that was made. He made it all. By the will of the Father, he spoke it into existence. And the one, the author, the creator, I, I cannot imagine what was going on in the angelic world. I, I, I don't believe personally the angels had any understanding of what salvation was really going to look like. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that the church is used to reveal to the angelic host the God, God's plan of redemption. The angels did not know what was going to happen. Remember, Jesus said that he was telling his disciples things that nobody had ever to known before. He said, because you're my friends. Uh, everybody else is a servant. You don't tell a servant what you're going to do, where you're going to go, what, what's in your mind. He didn't tell the angels. The angels didn't know. The angels, I believe they were absolutely, completely uh, amazed with awe when their creator uh, was given birth to by a woman by the name of Mary. And they sang praises, they were amazed. I mean, I think all of heaven was in shock for those 33 and a half years. And then when they saw their creator, their maker on the cross, and they saw the sins of the world put upon him, and they saw the father turn his face away from his only begotten son, and then they saw his soul go to hell. I, I, I think heaven was, even as it was dark upon the whole earth for three hours, there was a darkness in heaven, a, a sorrow in heaven that had never been known before and will be never known again. And I really think that heaven was filled with great sorrow. It's not that the angels didn't have faith because they were a creation of faith, but they didn't know the plan of God. They didn't really know the purposes of God. Now, if I'm wrong, when I get to heaven, I'll be corrected, but I don't think they did know. And it was a complete, total, absolute shock and amazement. And not just the fact that uh, God himself would be made sin, that God would hang on a cross, that God would die for the human race, for those who would believe on him, but in order to take rebellious, wicked, twisted, perverted, contaminated man, and then to give him a new nature and to elevate him to his right side. Can you imagine? The Bible says we're heirs and join heirs. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. 
I have not seen, ear have not heard, neither entered in the heart of man those things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. What, what deep mysteries? It's like there in Ephesians, where husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might cleanse it and wash it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And then he says, for this cause will a man leave his father and his mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And he says, this is a great mystery. I say, say a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ in the church. Here the groom is dying for his bride to be. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He gave himself for us while we were st still dead in our sins. You might say that even as Adam was put to sleep by the father and the, and the rib was taken in order to create the woman to stand at his side. So Christ laid down his life that the father could raise us up out of the side of Jesus and to become his bride forever almost makes you want to weep it's a great great sorrow but it's a great joy so heaven was filled with great sorrow and all of the earth was dark in verse 45 and the sun was darkened the sun the sun the sun was darkened well how did the whole earth go dark he said the sun was darkened now, let's stop and think about this for a moment. It doesn't say that he put a, a, a dark cloud between the sun and the earth to block the light. He said he put out the light of the sun for three hours. Whew. You know what that means? If that sun would have kept dark, that means there would have been no life within a couple of days. All life on the earth would have been dead put out the light of the sun because of who Christ was and what Christ was doing. Great sorrow, great sorrow. And then something else happened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. That means no longer was God going to represent himself in temples made by the hands of man. The way to the Father was being made. The veil was rent, the Father no longer, the Spirit of God was no longer going to be in the Holy of Holies, no longer. Uh, throughout history, ever since Moses built the Holy of Holies, and all the way up through the times of, uh, 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 up to the times of Christ, they dare not enter into the Holy of Holies, uh, except by the blood of the Lamb, the Passover Lamb once a year. And then he had to obey the Levitical laws, or otherwise they were dead. They would tie a rope to their ankle, and they had pomegranates on the dried out pomegranates on the bottom of the of, of the robe of the high priest and the priest that performed their duties. So if the bells stopped ringing, they knew that something was wrong with that priest, and they would pull. They would have to drag his his body out from the holy of holies. That's how serious it was to be in the presence of God. You know, we talk about the presence of God. Uh, to what extent have we experienced His presence, His tangible touch? But it says that the veil of the temple was ripped. Now, that was a very thick, thick. I think I read somewhere that uh, the way it was designed and made, it could have been six inches thick. I mean, it was supernatural. And, of course, we know at that time that there was an earthquake that hit, that hit the earth. Listen, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands commend my spirit. And having thus, thus he gave up the ghost. So let's look at, before we close here, just go back here to Psalms, if you will, with me. And let's just take a look at chapter 22. Chapter 22, and we'll begin here with verse 1. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but you can hear Jesus. So this is, you know, hundreds of years. The book of Isaiah, they figure Isaiah 51 is at least, you know, uh, 700 years before the coming of Christ. I don't know how long this is in the book of Psalms. Psalms 22, and David wrote this by the Spirit of God. You know, the Bible says, holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He, and, and this is exactly what Jesus cried out upon the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then it says, why art thou so far from me, so from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, 
but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and I'm not silent, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabit the praises of Israel. Jump down to verse uh, six. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Now he's going to describe the attitude the people had towards him at that moment. This is the attitude they had towards their Messiah. I mean, the Messiah they had been waiting for all of these years that they had hoped in, that they had uh, kept all kinds of customs and feast days and holy days and new moon days in recognition of him coming. And yet they have rejected the very one that came, their king, their creator, their Lord, their savior, they rejected him. Um, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach among men and despise the people. And they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on a Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighteth in him. And that's exactly what they were yelling at him as he was hanging upon the tree for us and for them. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Not only was the father his God, but he was also his father. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bowls have compassed me, strong bowls of Bashan have beset me round, around, and, and, and that's implying the, uh, the, Romans, the Romans, the soldiers, the Roman government. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion. Verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. All of my bones, now listen to me, there was no exaggeration. Every one of his bones, every single one. I don't know how many bones we have in our body. That'd be an interesting thing to look up. How many bones do we have in our body? Look it up, Michael, won't you? How many bones do we have in our body? It says every bone in his body was out of joint. Have you ever, I know Michael woke up this morning with a kink neck. His bone was, and it hurt. It was bothersome, prayed for him. Have you ever had a bone go out of joint? It says, every bone was out of joint. My heart is like the wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot surd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. How many? 206 bones in the human body. So it wasn't just that he was going through uh, spiritual torture, mental, emotional, but physical, tremendous physical pain. You know, I said this before, I'm going to say it again. Jesus said, no man takes my life. I lay it down on myself. When, right, right after Jesus died, they pierced his side, and it says a little bit of water and blood came out. That means that most likely Jesus, he... He should have died from lack of from loss of blood probably while he was still on the post when they whipped him. Matter of fact, remember Pilate said, because I think Pilate was shocked. Demons were in those Roman soldiers. You know, they made a movie called The Passion of Christ, and I know it's pretty brutal. I don't think it comes anywhere near to the truth. The Bible says his visage was marred, more marred than any man. When they beat him with a cat of nine tails, those two demon-possessed soldiers— I believe they stripped almost all the flesh off of his body. You, he, he should have died. And I believe that's why Peter, was, I mean, that's why Pilate was shocked. Behold the man. And they still cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And he did it for you. You, you know, when I got born again and, 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 and I saw Jesus upon the whipping post, it was a vision in my mind, but it was almost like I could see it. I didn't know much about healing, but I was reading by his stripes you were healed. And when I saw, as I was in prayer that day as a 19-year-old kid, I saw Jesus take those stripes upon his body. My heart broke, and I said this. I said it out loud. I said, I will never allow what Jesus went through for me upon that whipping post be for nothing. I'll never allow the devil to rob me of what he did for my healing. And I have stuck with that for over 46 years. 
I um, it's not pride, it's not arrogance, it's recognition, it's a revelation that by his stripes we were healed. And if we were, we was, and if we was, we am, and if we am, we is. I was healed. I am, it's mine. Not because of who I am or what I've done, not because I'm perfect, far from it, but because of what he's done, the price that he paid. No human should go to hell, none, not one. No human should not, there's not one Christian who should not be living in victory if they'll believe what the word of God says, not one of us. And it says here in the next verse 16, for dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. The Jewish people called anybody who was not a, a Jew or a, 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 of the tribe of Israel, a, of a descendant of Abraham, they called them dogs. And they said, the dogs have surrounded me. And um, they pierced my body. Now listen, this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And matter of fact, the Israelites, they should have had a revelation of what the Messiah was going to do. But they, to this day, the majority of the Jewish people still do not have the revelation. The Bible says the day will come when they will get this revelation, that they crucified the Messiah. And when they do, it will, they will be as if they slayed their firstborn. Their hearts will be broken. There will be such weeping and mourning. When is that going to happen, Pastor Mike? When all the nations of the world surround Israel for their complete and utter destruction. They will be surrounded by all the nations of the world. And during that time, when they have no hope, when all technology is of no avail, no countries to stand with him, they will cry out to their God. And at that moment, the Bible says the veil will be ripped off of their eyes and it will see that it was the Messiah they had crucified, their beloved King and Lord, their creator. And then the Bible says when the veil is ripped away from their eye, each one of them will rise up like a David in the spirit of a David and they will go forth and prevail against their enemy. So I know that the Bible says the two-edged sword's coming out of the mouth of Christ and the blood will flow as the high as the, as, as underneath, uh, all the way up to the, the, the uh, bridle of the horse. But I'm telling you what, the, Israel, the, the Jewish people will, will be born again and filled with the Holy Ghost in that day and they will rise up like David's. He says, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, the lion. The Bible says the devil is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. See, we're not even dealing with the demonic powers that were assailing him and attacking him while he was upon the cross. And when his soul died, they, they dragged his soul to hell. Now, devils are not in hell. I know people teach us. On the way, when a person dies, the demonic power begins to torture and torment people before their soul enters into hell. And a lot of times when people tell you their stories, they never got to hell when they talk about devils were tormenting them. See, when I, when I went to hell, devils didn't torment me. You know why? Because my heart was right with God. Devils had no authority over me. Kenneth Hagin tells the story that he died actually three times before he got saved. And the, every time he'd die, his, his, his demons would begin to afflict him and attack him. I didn't even know this, of course, uh, until years later uh, when I began to research it. And then the third time he died, he said the devils and demons were torturing him. And, 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 and he was headed towards a large gate. And as he got towards this large gate, the devils let go of him. And, and, and he knew that if he went through that gate, the gate of hell, that he would never come back. And even in that condition of death, he died. He said he cried out to God and a booming voice spoke and called him back into his body. When he came back into his body, he was praying the prayer of salvation. <laughs> That's when he got gloriously born again. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So when I was in hell, 
everybody was cursing God. When I was in hell, I was praising God. I was worshiping God. I was exalting God. And I heard the voice of the Lord, a booming, thundering voice say, let my servant go. And that's when I was ripped, my soul was ripped back out of hell. Well, pastor, I don't really believe your soul went to hell. Okay. All I know is whether it was in the body, out of the body, I don't know. It was so real. It was more real. Have you ever had an experience with God that was more, more real than the physical world? I have more real. So uh, I, I want you to take a look here as we close now in the book of Isaiah 53. And I just want to read this. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Christ is the arm of the Lord, by the way. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So all of these movies that make, look, make Jesus look like a Hollywood star, they're not true. He, he, he was in a physical body. Oh, I believe he, yes, he was in good shape. But it, it was in a body that anybody would go, wow, look at that. Isn't that amazing? He, he didn't have no charisma. He, he, he was in a physical body that was plain uh, in ordinary wrapping, brown paper wrapping maybe, and nobody would look at him or esteem him. Remember, they wanted Saul as king. You know why? Because he was a, the biggest man among them all. They, nobody wanted David as king. He was a shepherd boy. He was a nobody. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our face from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he, was ma he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he has done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. See his resurrection. Here it is. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors.